Hi, everyone. Hi, Naveen. Hi, Selmer. Uh, all of you. I'm so happy to be here and I'm so happy to introduce you our first keynote in the first day, Sarah Fletcher. Just going to say a few words about Sarah. All of you know her, but that's the way it goes. Sarah is head of Cranfield University, University Industrial Psychology and Human Factors Research Group uh, that aims at development of user-centered design performance and safety of human-centered processes and work environments in modern manufacturing, particularly working to enhance the design and implementation of collaborative industrial human robot systems. Sarah Fletcher is actively involved in the development uh, in the UK and internationally of standards for robotics, industrial safety, and ergonomics of human uh, system interaction. So, Sarah, two words to you now. Welcome. No sound. We are not able to get yours. So you would think after a year and a half of just doing virtual meetings, that I would um, have that covered, but so sorry for that. <laughs> um, thank you for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to be here. Um, and as Selma said, it's rather, um, it's, it's rather daunting that so many other people have put so much uh, time and effort into to this conference. So um, hats off to them and, and uh, thank you very much for welcoming me. Um, and also following on from what Naveen said about the difficulties of virtual presentations, um, I'd like to also just forewarn you that two things really. One is that I'm very much used to some human interaction in my presentation. So um, I'm not sure I'll have the timing right because I'll have less chat perhaps in this format. Um, if you could save questions to the end, that would be really great um, for this format. And also I can't control um, home life. So I'm here at home and I have a very needy cat. If you hear a meow, please bear with me um, for that. Okay, let me share my screen. I'll try. Ah, there it is. Is that showing? Yes, we can see this. Excellent. Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction, um, Isabel. That was very, very nice. My um, presentation is on are we expect are ready to expect people to work with industrial robots, which is a a strange question given that we are already um, employing people to work with industrial robots and indeed we do expect them to. Um, but it's just a, a, an overview from my point of view, uh, based on my work actually, um, and encounters, to, to think about the ethical side of things because that's what this conference is about and I think it's um, relevant to the sort of work that I conduct. So the outline of the presentation today, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on the industrial context. Um, I'm sure most of you, I suppose, in this session particularly will be aware of that. But I think it's really important to remember the background uh, and think about how human issues have been addressed until now, what the historical context is, because it's the reason there's a, a neglect still uh, perv pervasive today. And where the ethics are in, in system design. Um, it's not to say that there are no ethics in system design, it's just that they're not formally addressed even to this day, really. Um, I'll go through as a way of um, following on from that, some origins of my own interest in human systems interactions, um, not to take you down a deep and unnecessarily long pathway of my own career, but just how I discovered the hidden impact of human characteristics uh, at a time when I was told there, there wouldn't be any impact of human characteristics. Um, which started my career in this area um, and how and looking at how we can better design human centered systems, which I'm pleased to say I'm now one of a multitude of people trying to, to um, investigate. Um, I'll look at some examples of human robot investigations that I've been involved in, uh, careful not to encroach on some of the other presentations that are coming later in the uh, in the session uh, and look at how we explore human needs for better user centered design and the ultimate 
point of all this is there's a link between human centered design and ethical design that's in, inextricable. Um, so I don't come at this from a, a, an ethical philosophical point of view. I'm not an ethicist as, as such. I'm very much a human factors person, but I believe it's, it's um, you have to relate and remind, the, uh, remind yourselves of the relationship between ethical design and human centered design because it, it's, it's uh, inextricable, as I said. Okay, so going into the, uh, this history that I said I would just briefly look at, um, wonderful pictures, aren't they, up the top there? Um, if we think about how, um, how the design of uh, factories began, we were talking about taking very much craft work, people's individual craft and completion of a whole product into these centralized um, systems with machines, um, which would obviously improve the um, uh, output, produce, uh, improve productivity. And it meant fitting people in amongst those machines. Very little thought would have gone into how the um, individuals would have fared. And eventually that led to moving assembly lines from 1913. And of course, this has led to a, a prior design priority for technology and machines, which remains today. We still think of what product we need to, to, to produce, uh, what's the technology and machines we need to do that primarily and then how do how do we fit humans amongst that obviously we still need human skills but but very much the priority is on how to improve processes with the use of the application of technology and machinery and now robotics so back in those days the management and organization of labor was undertaken to standardize manual work and reduce human variability or as you, i like to think of it um behavior um, it's about making people perform in the same way, um, trying to get people to, to function as, as regularly and consistently as machines, because that was key to production efficiency. And of course, that involved then task simplification. Oh, sorry, I've gone for that. <laughs> task simplification. It meant dividing up the tasks, analysing what was required, dividing up tasks so that the, the human portion and the machine portion of the task or uh, production um, would be regulated. So it meant reducing the number of motions, labor and training needs of humans. And again, trying to prioritize that machine function and fit the human around it. So we had some emergence of human impacts as a result of that. Um, obviously skill and flexibility, if you're training people to do a job of a, a tiny uh, repetitive part of a, a, a process, there's a, they, they sort of start losing their, their total skills. So the craft-based work that we originally had, we can see people starting to just be able to perform a limited amount of functions. There's a lack of a, a, a accountability for production because if you're a small cog in, the, in a very big system, uh, your accountability for that portion or the, the, the quality, the errors, whatever, um, is reduced. And then you've also got, of course, the speed versus accuracy um, trade-off. And all of these have an impact on efficiency and quality of the performance, but also on uh, human uh, well-being as well. We see a rise in repetitive strain, uh, manual handling issues, and these ob obviously knock on to well-being and absenteeism. And to some extent, this, this is what we're still trying to balance today. We also see this alienation, monotony and boredom. So if you're only having to do a small amount of work, um, adding a small, tiny, discrete component of work to an entire process, you become a little alienated, using a very Marxist term, I know, but you become alienated from the actual process and the, the output. You become perhaps uh, bored and uh, maybe, you know, physically you may have some repetitive strain, but you also mentally um, strained by the boredom and this leads, uh, leads to an um, decrease in intrinsic work motivation. Um, just to clarify, extrinsic work motivation is your pay, rewards, um, I don't know, benefits of the job in terms of salary and holidays and things like that. Your intrinsic work motivation is your genuine interest in doing the job, the reason you look forward to doing it, um, which is very, very important, obviously. And so we had a range of um, interest in these, these human impacts develop, um, the rise of human factors um, as a discipline, human relations theory, 
job design techniques and socio technical systems approaches. Um, and these led to in further interest in not just the physical um, aspects of uh, industrial labor, but also organization psychological uh, impacts. Um, and then without going through them all, you're probably aware of a lot of these um, uh, in, in interventions and uh, approaches. We see the rise of interest in quality circles, issues to do with job design that will influence motivation like job enlargement and job enrichment. Job rotation is a very important one that's, that's still um, common today, uh, teamwork as well. So we see this sort of, from the, the history of the beginning of um, manufacturing work, uh, an emergence of human problems and there has been some efforts to counter them. However, in the engineering approaches to job design, we still see quite a, a mechanical approach to understanding human labor and human input. So the fundamental aim is always really to improve efficiency and effectiveness uh, with the faster, cheaper, better um, slogan. And line balancing and workstation design um, is also undertaken both to improve system performance um, and regularity, but also to uh, control and manage the human variability. Um, and they used, uh, it's based on process time. They use things like methods time measurement, which you can see an example of on the right there, the MODAPS plus system, which divides human tasks or human outputs, uh, human activities into discrete components. So, as you can see there, you can see the one, two, three, four, five pointing to different um, arm movements. This enables a, an engineering design engineer to um, work out what would be required of the human in terms of physical exertion. So this enables, for example, putting it in a very simple terms, um, in, in standard time value to work out the time and effort required for a, a small, um, pick and place using an, an arm to whether it's further reached out, that would obviously involve greater time and greater effort. So it's very much based on standard time values assigned to different parts of the body and then working out how the body will be used and therefore the standard time values that, that um, need to be accounted for in production. And that's used to balance uh, workstations across an assembly line to make sure the exertion or time are needed for those um, activities is consistent and that uh, that makes the system run more efficiently and without lumps and bumps if you like. Importantly human factors has always been considered at a later stage of design in a more often in a more remedial way so for example uh, methods time management could be used to design a workstation or a set of workstations and then when problems occur after installation after operations begin, uh, then some remedial changes might be made. But, but perhaps my point is that at earlier stages, when human factors could have perhaps been uh, included a bit more, uh, they weren't, this sort of engineering approach was used. So the ideal state for a very long time, uh, and perhaps still today, is the lights out factories where robotics and automation um, take care of everything and humans aren't needed because that essentially would be the most ascent, uh, the efficient approach. However, we all know that um, human skill is very much needed for many tasks. Um, and the key assumption, oh, I keep going forward, sorry. Uh, the key assumption is that human variability um, is designed out by using these um, techniques, these engineering techniques, as I said, by line balancing, by systematically um, assigning human activities into Type, standard time value based tasks. Um, human variability is designed out. And that's where I begin my own personal story. Uh, when I went to do my PhD, um, it was uh, a long time ago now, but looking at human variability because the background was that um, I'm sponsored by a, a major automotive um, organization, uh, car, car uh, production uh, organization. And uh, they found that even with identical manufacturing systems, the performance would vary very differently between identical lines, meaning that the sets of people and across shifts even, the sets of people that are, the, that are operating the line may have seem to inf influence the um, uh, system performance, but also that um, 
manufacturing system design predictions were very different from what actually happened when you had people working in them. So if you took a very me mechanistic uh, discrete event simulation type uh, analysis of a production line where you view people as simple resources that are either present or absent, um, you would come up with pre predictions where you treat everyone the same, I suppose. Uh, but when you actually put people in the line, their behaviors in some way cause some variation. So my, my initial research question was, you know, is you know, human variability really designed out? Um, so I looked at um, this very this question, do worker attributes influence system performance? And if so, what human attributes and how can they, if the design of the systems is so regulated and the automation is so uh, limiting on human variability? And this was one of the first pieces of data I, I developed uh, or found. Um, and the case study is, as I put here, one day in the life of an assembly line. So it's not really a full day, but um, if I can take you through it across the x-axis, this is time of day. And um, this is a, a assembly line where job rotation was very strict. Um, people adhered to job rotation very well. Um, and across the y-axis, we can see recorded production time. And that reflects where the component would arrive at the workstation, people would perform their, their job on it and then press the button to move the, the platen or the, the work piece on again. Um, so each of these port data points represents the time uh, of the, the, the platen and the work that was in front of the person and being operated on. So um, as you can see across here, I think you can see real footprints of different human behavior. Now, in a, it's a, these are balanced assembly workstations, which means they've been designed to have the same human demand or, or similar or equivalent um, human activity and input and timings, those standard time value, values that were derived from uh, motion time measurement. So, um, so they've been you know, designed to be equivalent. Um, and on one of these workstations, I took these timings. Now the average cycle time was supposed to be 17 to 21 seconds. So it would be around this region. Um, and this was after 12 weeks, we monitored um, these workstations, but this is just for, for one portion of a day. And here you can see, I think, clear footprint. As I said, this person between six and seven o'clock fairly consistently is working within the prescribed average cycle, cycle time of, of 17 to 21 seconds. And you see, uh, worker two coming on at seven between seven and eight much more spread in their cycle times for whatever reason you can clearly see a work break at eight o'clock where things shut down and, and stop um, and then people come back on as you can see here at lunchtime um, you can see a greater a half hour I believe for lunch there and of course interesting you see this character who comes back on after that lunch break and is working at quite a, a slower rate than, than previously. Um, probably that post-lunch dip and being full up and I don't know, just getting back into the swing of it. Um, another interesting aspect is you see handover time. So at the two o'clock handover, you do see a reduction here in, um, or a slower, you see slower um, cycle time straight after. That would obviously be explained by the handover procedure and, and somebody getting back into their job, but then it soon recovers and they start working at a better, um, faster rate. And as I said, without, you know, we can go into to lots of aspects of these characteristics, but I, for me, this was exciting because I was told um, the engineering approach is designed out human variability. People can't affect the system. You know, what's going on? What is it about people that are doing this? But I, I found from this, you know, we're only talking about seconds differences, I know, but it showed some human idiosyncratic patterns that I felt re reflected human characteristics which I think is still important to what we're dealing with today in terms of the ethics of um, human system interaction, human robot interaction, uh, that people can make such a big difference, even if it's not really understood and if it's very, you know, very um, limited by system design. Looking at that data from a, a slightly different perspective, uh, looking at the individual workstation performance. Um, again, this is, was very interesting early data that came out because each one of these um, lines represents a, one of the different 10 workstations. 
And yes, they're generally around this area where they should be performing. There's a centralization there, which isn't too bad. You see some slight deviations, I suppose, from some of the workstations. But this was very interesting. This very high peak here at about seven to eight seconds of workstation activity time um, for, for one particular um, workstation. And the interesting thing is when I delivered this data back to the company, they told me it was wrong. It just wasn't possible. It was not possible for a workstation, for people at a workstation to consistently perform um, work that had been done, designed for the, the 17 to 21 seconds to be, to be performed at this rate. It just wasn't possible. So feeling fairly confident that, you know, my sensor measurements had, had been okay, um, went back to the, the, the workstation, uh, to the assembly line and um, surreptitiously sort of just observed what was happening. And true enough, they were performing at that rate. It was very, very interesting. So the workers were performing at that sort of rate because they didn't get to, to analyze the um, exact uh, task characteristics, but there was something about that particular task that made it fairly easy to do the components, to put the, do that part of the um, activity quite quickly and then push forward the, press the button, push forward the platens until the work had piled up slightly, caused a bottleneck. When that occurred, that meant the, the worker was then relieved of duty because there was no work that they could actually do and contribute. And so um, unsurprisingly, from a human nature point of view, it meant the worker could then, back in those days, it was feasible, light a cigarette and read the newspaper. So it was, uh, you know, <laughs> quite a, an amusing part of the, the study, but just goes to show, and this is what excited me, what goes to show was that the limitations of system design, with the engineering approach with this um, assumption that, that that would design out human variability wasn't true. Without a, a more in-depth understanding of human nature and uh, the possibilities of human performance within certain task characteristics, um, you were never going to get a balanced um, line um, in terms of standard time values and human performance. And this takes me to the job characteristics model, which you may be aware of. It's a very famous model used in, um, in industrial psychology. But um, the, it reminded me of this, uh, this model because in this model, you see the core job characteristics, which are you know, what I'm talking about really, the characteristics of the task. Um, there's some real psychological states that, that emanate from those. So skill variety, how, vari how various is your job, you know, in terms of enjoy, I suppose, what, how enjoyable is, is it in terms of the, the, the different skills that it requires? Um, how much do you identify with the task and understand it? Task significance is also very important. If you're just adding one widget to a, to a, a complete com um, product, does that give you a sense of significance? Or if you understand that the, um, the task contributes to the complete product, um, which is important to life. So for example, if you're con contributing to the production of a car, production of a, um, a health um, healthcare system or whatever, um, the autonomy is how much, obviously, how much you get the freedom to, to work within your own um, requirements and preferences and feedback, what feedback you get on your performance. And those lead to a set of critical psychological states, um, meaningfulness of work, responsibility for outcomes, and knowledge of results, for example. And those have an impact on uh, work motivation, quality of work performance and satisfaction. And of course, there are relationships therefore with uh, turnover, absenteeism and other uh, human states. So the, the, the findings I got reminded me of this model, um, which is, but has been very well used in, in psychology um, and does have some um, influence, I think, uh, and it, uh, relevance to the ethical question that we're, we're talking about here. How much do our jobs uh, in human robot interaction cover those core job characteristics and um, invoke those critical psychological states that will then lead to personal and work outcomes? So I then, in my career, started working in industrial robots. Um, again, looking at the engineering assumptions, the advantages are, as we all know, reliability, efficiency, speed, repetition, 
um, and that they were good for um, the low skill tasks of a manufacturing process. So typically kept upstream because of um, health and safety. Uh, there's a need to separate them from uh, the workforce because of their strength and, and uh, potential injury. Um, the disadvantages of that obviously is limited flexibility, limited flexibility in terms of what the robot can do itself, but also if they're separated from the human being, that means that a lot of human tasks have to be um, kept separate, including the ones that actually would be better done by a robot. If it came at a, a time in the process where the they were, you know, next to um, a, a human uh, skill required process. So um, it's not just about apportioning um, tasks to human skill or robot skill. It's also about how far, how, where do they need to sit in the assembly process so that they're kept separate from, from people. So, um, so robots are, you know, traditional industrial robots, not good for the complex tasks, craft based skill tasks, um, and also the separation from the workforce could cause a little bit of perturbation in that um, it didn't allow some robotics to be employed uh, where they really should be uh, alongside people. But of course, um, as time's gone on and more recently, we have a, a whole generation of power and force limited robots with advanced set capabilities that can now limit collision impacts. They tend to be smaller, uh, but increasingly uh, larger in size and payload. Um, as you can see on that picture on the right, that's a larger one, um, the FANUC. Um, these enable cooperation and co-location for better functional allocation, because it means that a small robot like this or this can be put um, alongside a, a human being to do the, to a repetitive low skill task, alongside a, um, perhaps this worker needs to do a, a more skilled task for which we cannot employ a robot, and they can work alongside each other, whereas before they couldn't. Uh, with the higher payload uh, rate robots, collaborative robots that have been designed with these uh, power and force limitations, that means we can have people uh, have them uh, carrying out some heavier tasks uh, again safely alongside a human. And although they're not suitable for all applications, you know, there's some da more dangerous tasks. You know, for example, drilling and welding. They do enable human robot collaboration or cooperation or co-location for many production tasks. So that's a step forward. Now, going to my area of, of, of knowledge really, which is aerospace manufacturing, I see those um, early uh, issues that I spoke about, you know, the physical dangers, the, the repetition and uh, unsafe working conditions. And these are just a, a, a few examples. Um, and I say here, you know, huge variability, huge variability in requirements and demands, but little opportunity for robots. Well. Actually, there is a, quite a lot of opportunity for robots. You can probably see that, that you know, in, in, in this example, wouldn't it be great if there's a, a, a some sort of robotic system to assist this uh, worker um, and stop them having to go inside these cavities? Um, here, there's a, um, again, there's, you know, a, a more um, robotic intervention would help uh, relieve the uh, strains being caused there. Um, and here we have some quite physical load um, tasks that, Really, as you can see, the, the, the human beings are fairly redundant there. All they're doing is picking and placing a heavy object at physical strain and stress to them, but actually with no um, human skill really being uh, contributed to the, to the process. So seeing what robots can down, down deliver and seeing these practices now still ongoing in a, um, in a modern high value manufacturing um, assembly uh, system, um, there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, this is a slide a little bit old now, but just showing, I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, uh, the, the rise in um, human robot collaboration um, as a result of these uh, new developments in robot design uh, and functionality. Um, I think I include it mainly because the, the I did include this in a previous presentation at ICRES, I think it was 2017, and I made a joke about Brexit because of UK being down the bottom there. Uh, which didn't go down too well, but um, it still amuses me. But um, just to show that you know the the it, the transformation in manufacturing is a real thing that's uh, that's happening. So from my point of view as a human factors uh, person, I think about the human impacts of all of this. 
Um, and the way we focus so much on the technical um, machinery development and priority in the development of systems. So complexity and cost still determines degree of collaboration. The, the allocation of functions is still very much dependent on complexity and whether the human needs to be able to, to do that part of the job and how expensive it will be to either employ the human versus the, the robot. Um, and current standards still focus very much on physical safety, which is understandable because up to, to recent times, with systems being physically separated from um, the human workforce, there's been no need to think about anything other than incursion into that um, workspace, the robot workspace, and impacts on physical safety. But of course, as we're getting robots now to work to coexist um, or to collaborate with humans at much closer, um, closer proximity, and actually with some cognitive engagement and interaction, of course we're getting, uh, we're get near, getting nearer to a stage where we need to think about the cognitive and effective impact, uh, effective meaning emotional or, or sensitive uh, sensitivity uh, impacts. So if you see here on this, this is uh, not based on any data whatsoever, just on the thoughts that happened in my head. Um, you have a low, uh, low impact on people's cognitive and affective um, states when you have an independent uh, degree of collaboration, i.e. the robot is independent there in the, in the bottom left corner. Uh, and then if you increase, you have a semi-collaborative system where turn-taking um, sort of a system where the robot does its uh, tasks then makes the, the, the workspace safe so the person can then go in and do their tasks. Of course, that then means they've got a slightly more uh, cognitive and effective impact because the person has to be aware of the system state, aware when they can go in and, and do their duties um, and then leave. So there's a, an increasing um, emotional and cognitive uh, impact there. And then finally in the top right corner, we have a fully, if we have a fully collaborative system, um, we then have the human and the, the robot working consistently alongside each other, um, it's not so much a, a stop and start turn taking process, but a, an ongoing interaction. And in that case, you will have a, a high degree of cognitive and effective impact because you've got people having to think about what they're doing, be aware of the system state in a continuous way. Uh, and of course, in return from the robot engineer's point of view, uh, the robot needs to be aware as well. But um, I'm looking at it from the human uh, side of things. So thinking about human impacts, and obviously that translates to ethical impacts. There are obvious uh, a set of um, issues. Employment anxieties is one you hear about often in the media um, and around you know, people worrying about the robot's going to take my job. Um, and that can be a huge uh, issue for, for a workforce and can affect their acceptance and, um, you know, and their uh, adoption of a new system. Culture and expectations, if you have an organisational culture um, and expectations of work as is, how do, does that workforce then, an organisation indeed, then deal with the change to a, a, an automated system? Cognitive workload uh, can be affected uh, by human-robot interaction because it's one of the things that may increase. I mean, it, robot systems are usually designed to decrease cognitive load, uh, workload, but that's not the case because you have to also in, incorporate the idea of, of monitoring, greater monitoring that's involved. Trust and comfort and situation awareness are also human responses that very much influence uh, in, in situ performance, but also the acceptance and adoption of uh, automation. Reduced responsibility. Now you can have that in teams anyway, and that the principle there is diffused responsibility when, for example, you have a team of, of workers, um, they can, there can be a reduced responsibility for individual tasks because the collective responsibility supersedes that. You, you have a sense of, I don't know, hiding behind the group, let's say. Um, with a human team, sorry, human uh, robot team, you could have a, a different but similar uh, sense of re reduced responsibility for the work output. Uh, performance monitoring is a key ethical issue. Um, people aren't used to being monitored, they're used to being monitored, but not so much in terms of a, um, a data output sense that would happen with a human robot system. Uh, and data protection, very similar to that. 
um, forced collaboration. And here I'm referring to the worker who's always worked either with a human teammate or indeed on their own in a job rotation kind of setup. Um, now they're being forced to collaborate with a, a system, uh, a non-human system, and there may be some impacts of that. And lastly, uh, certainly not the last, but <laughs> last in my list, is reliance and relationships, um, which sounds rather soft and fuzzy to the design world. But if you think about how connected we become to our, our tools, our, um, our in, uh, non-human tools, a car, um, a washing machine, uh, whatever it might be, that's going to happen with robots. And I've seen for myself um, some disagreements, shall we say, and volatility on a shop floor over somebody borrowing somebody's spanner um, or, or wrench. And if you find that tall tools um, that, that currently used are being um, possessed and there's a people have a relationship with them of, to some extent, how are they going to feel when, I don't know, they come on the two o'clock shift and someone's done something with their, their uh, robot teammate? Um, which sounds, like I said, rather um, social science, but that's really an, an important issue. Um, people will form relationships with robotics. And I think there's, there's military um, based research that has shown that um, the loss of a robot teammate can have significant impact on uh, team performance. So the Industrial Psychology and Human Factors Group, which is uh, where I'm from, we, I developed that in 2012, specifically to examine both the cognitive and physical aspects of human robot interaction. So to some extent, the human factors um, profession will never separate physical from the human because they're both interconnected. So, but we'll look at traditional methods of understanding the physical uh, strains and stresses of working on um, in industrial systems. But it was importantly to, to raise this aspect of um, cognitive aspects, particularly in relation to human robot interaction. So here's an example in this picture of um, some eye tracking. Uh, the, the candidate here is wearing a, a eye tracking glasses. Um, and so we can look at, in this example, what he's looking at, what he's looking at, what's grabbing his attention, um, uh, and so on. So we don't just use eye tracking, but that's an example of why the um, Industrial Psychology and Human Factors Group was set up uh, specifically to address this need uh, that currently wasn't being uh, met or satisfied in manufacturing for cognitive analysis. So we started off with physical, more physical um, studies. We looked at uh, confined space working in particular because of the aerospace manufacturing um, predominance of our work. And as you can see in these rather horrible pictures, this is what is still common practice today in uh, wing manufacturing, excuse me, I've got hair in my mouth, um, aerospace wing manufacturing. Um, these aren't just for the camera. This is what somebody has to do day to day. Uh, they may be issued with PPE, personal protection equipment, uh, to go into a wing tank. They go through a, a standard size of, of hatch here. Um, but the PPE that they would be given, so bump caps, protective clothing, etc., as you can see, would constrain their ability to get through that hatch. So there's real physical uh, difficulty just getting in to do the work. And then when you're in the, in the, uh, the hatch, you issued with safety mats, but often, again, they're not used because they restrict space. Um, there are issues with the climate, if you like, it's very hot, it can be very hot in those conditions. And often you have to lay across these, uh, these ribs and the bottom here, um, which are very uncomfortable on the body. Uh, this is an example of one of the safety mats here, which it isn't going to restrict it, so this guy is using this. But again, there's often blind working like this, um, and having to get through small um, hatches and, and it's very, very difficult. So we wanted to establish because these are, tr these are very uh, traditional and ongoing methods, just to get a gauge on, on how difficult they re really were and whether there was indeed uh, in, a, a use of, um, or an application of robotics that we could work towards to alleviate these issues. So one of the first uh, studies we did many years ago was to look at, well, this assumption that we have to hold a, an aircraft wing at a horizontal position 
is actually one of the problems because you're expecting people to go up through these hatches and then go through the hatches as I just showed. Um, whereas if you tilted the wing, which is in an engineering sense possible, although not easy, would that then alleviate the, the human work? Um, and again, from an ethical point of view, this is a, a perfect analysis. From an engineering point of view, perhaps not so essential. Uh, but we did task analysis and an observation of the current process so we could map the, the very problematic steps, um, what, what, what parts of the tasks were really difficult for, for people. We then modeled these in CAD and we compared current data to predict impacts of a transfer to a new orientation with an open wing box. So just on this theory that if you kept the top skin of the, the aircraft wing open and you tilted it to a different orientation, would that, um, would that help? So we then did participant studies after that modeling uh, using, using inertial motion capture suits. Um, and we used it in two conditions. We had a section of the wing um, modeled and built uh, a mock-up. And we, did, we had two conditions with the top skin of the aircraft on and with it off. Um, and we measured people's, um, their, their movements, um, their motions and their uh, physical um, postural positions. Um, and then conducted a postural analysis to identify the musculoskeletal risk. So unsurprisingly, um, the lowest musculoskeletal risk would be at a, with an open box at the 90 degree and 135 degree um, situation. So whether the, if the box was upright or slightly tilted so that they could reach all of the, the parts without uh, crawling through, um, obviously that was better with the highest uh, risk at the closed box at 135. So, not quite the current um, orientation of 180, 180 um, but still that current orientation presents a very high uh, musculoskeletal risk for shoulders and arms particularly. So the results of this haven't been taken up, um, but it's shown that for ethical reasons, there are engineering, um, engineering design things that can be done to alleviate uh, human strain. And we look more at the robotic side of things. You can see how this uh, leads to a, a story. Uh, we looked at human robot collaboration to perhaps replace those situations where the human labor is redundant, as I referred to earlier, where human workers are used to literally just pick up and place a large component at risk to them physically um, and really not using any human skill. The only human skill used here is, is the guy in the, in the center who will sit underneath and he will fix the, the you know, apply um, fixings to attach the, the, um, in the component. So these guys on the end are simply holding, positioning up, down, left, right, getting it into the right position so that the, the worker in the middle can perform his duty. Uh, and this is a perfect, um, example of a task that would lend itself to, to robotics uh, for a robot to hold that component in place so that the person can do the job and apply their skill and alleviate the, the unskilled work so that those other workers can then go and do more skilled work elsewhere. Um, it's a perfect candidate. So at Cranfield, uh, we developed a reconfigurable uh, 360 degree monitored um, the demonstrator for flap installation which would measure the flaps because as you know, the, the, the components are always very slightly um, different in terms of um, datum uh, measurements. Um, and then pick up the, the component, carry it towards uh, where it needed to be placed. Um, and so then the system state would make it safe for human, uh, the human to enter the, the zone um, and can perform the skilled part of the operation. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's reconfigurable and we conducted studies to identify human performance and psychosocial impacts. Um, it's a great example of where robotics can be applied. I think from a human factors point of view, it wasn't a great example in that it wasn't true collaboration. It was that very uh, stop start um, human um, robot turn taking. Because uh, obviously the human has to work, has to wait till the state, uh, the system is in a safe state before entering. Um, and I suppose what we're we're really working towards is a, a less um, less disruptive um, system. But even so, it's a it's a great example. 
We've also worked on automation of visual inspection, um, not so much involved with the development of the automation itself, um, but just an example of where human factors uh, can be applied to improve the ethics of, um, of, of these systems. So we did uh, worked with um, quite a number of uh, uh, inspectors in uh, in industry to look at their the processes that they undertook to um, visually inspect components and as you can see on the right it shows the marginal difference I think from first eye, eye sight of um, first sight of the uh, of the component um, as you look increasingly you can see variations but um, it, it I suppose reflects the skill that's involved um, in those tasks and we tried to extra extract that information. And what we're talking about here is the difference between um, tacit knowledge and procedural knowledge. Um, procedural knowledge is where people will follow a procedure to do a, to do a task um, and it's very much regulated where tacit knowledge is less formally documented. It's um, the knowledge that a, a, an experienced worker holds in their head about how to do things and how to classify things. Um, that is perhaps not documented, it's just in their own skill set and, and possibly not even verbalized at all. Um, so in this, we were able to um, identify the search pattern, where the search patterns deviated from standard operating instructions um, and where they were influenced actually by specific training and trainer um, situations. So, uh, you, you know, it's very much um, highlighted how training and skills education influences how people perform and go on to continue performing. But importantly, it, it led to a rationalization of the classification systems that were being used. So whereas there was a, I think something over a hundred types of classification of different defect in a component, we were able to reduce it to under 10 um, because where systems had been, uh, classification systems had been used over and over again, they had become unwieldy and, and, and perhaps overlapping. So, um, that led to uh, development of, of an automated system that could um, better perform that and assist humans. It wasn't to, again, it wasn't to re replace human skills in, in um, it was to, uh, in visual inspection, it was to assist them and to enable that classification. We also looked at over the years, barriers to human robot collaboration implementation. You know, what is it about organizations that prevent them? Because that's a huge um, barrier to uh, the development of or the implementation of automation is, is organizational willingness and knowledge of their uh, readiness for automation. We conducted um, semi-structured interviews and conducted thematic analysis um, to understand the interrelationships between worker involvement and psychological factors. And from the literature review, none of those I would think were um, surprising factors that were found at an organizational level and at the individual level things like trust, mental workload, situation awareness, they're all things that are standard um, issues when you have uh, new technologies implemented. But what was interesting in our, in, in our case studies that we, was that we also identified lack of union involvement, um, a lack of system integrators awareness of the manual process complexity, i.e. the tacit knowledge, uh, not capturing manual process variability prior to the automation and not allocating sufficient resources, i.e. human resources, to develop the automated system um, in terms of current workers and experienced workers. Uh, those were new issues that were not really found in the literature. And we also identified that trust was an underlying factor in all of these, human trust, organizational trust, etc. We then explored trust in um, industrial human robot collaboration a little more to understand what it actually meant, what does it consist of, uh, we conducted an exploratory qualitative study with thematic analysis to identify basic perceptions and reactions to robots um, in a simple handover task, just to understand what made people um, trust or not trust uh, 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 the robot. 24 pri primary factors emerged and we could separate those or categorize those into human, uh, to robot and task related factors. And what was interesting was that there was no existing measure of trust in industrial robots. You can measure trust by just asking someone, do you trust this robot? And you can get a yes, no answer. But that's not very helpful for design purposes because it won't tell you how to design it um, better, how to design your system better. What's, what is it about your design that's made uh, trust better or worse? 
Um, and you could also measure trust on a scale. You could perhaps say on a scale of one to 10, how much do you trust it? Again, you've got limited, it tells you a little bit more, uh, but it doesn't tell you those factors that, that influence trust. So we looked at measures of trust. There are also more involved measures of trust where they split the trust into dimensions. They tell you what aspects of a, a, of, of a situation invoke trust or not, but there was nothing relevant to the industrial robots. Uh, context, which is important because if you want to design an industrial robot system, you want to know what it is about the robot itself, the gripper, the speed, etc., that influence um, people's trust, and therefore in, it, you can improve its adoption. So, we developed a basic hu human robot collaboration trust psychometric scale. Um, this was done over three separate uh, sub studies. We used a single arm medium payload industrial robot, a twin arm medium payload, and a single arm large payload, the one that was used uh, in the demonstrator for the flap installation. Um, from the results of the uh, previous survey, we developed a 24 item questionnaire and administered it, administered it across those three studies. There were large sample sizes in each of these studies, so uh, results were reliable. Um, our analysis of variance showed no difference across those um, in terms of the data collected across those uh, studies. So that meant there was no dif significant difference according to condition. It didn't mean that, for example, the more anthropomorphic robot gave very different results from the others. Um, we also conducted reliability analysis and principal components analysis, which removed items that didn't con contribute to the scale reliability. Uh, and that reduced the 24 item questionnaire to a 10 item scale. And that then covers three dimensions which were identified as most important, uh, most relevant to trust in industrial robots. And that is perceived motion and speed, perceived ro robot and gripper reliability and perceived safety. Um, and I'm emphasizing the word perceived there because obviously this is based on subjective uh, evaluations. It's not real speed, real motion, um, that we've measured, it's on people's um, accounts and people's opinions of the motion speed and gripper and safety that they've experienced in those situations. But even so, that's still indicative of the important uh, characteristics of a robot, human robot system that are important to their trust. So um, moving on to another aspect um, that leads on from that, we then thought about, well, if we've identified those uh, key characteristics of a robot, human robot design that are important to uh, human trust, and we know that um, CAD design, uh, digital human modeling is increasingly used to de design systems and, and, and um, in the engineering approaches uh, used to design um, the human activity of any system. Um, we thought about creating a rule. What, what would be a rule, if you like, that we would most reflect uh, an important aspect of design, and could it be integrated into CAD modeling? So we set out to, um, to identify a rule between trust and speed, because trust and speed seemed the most natural um, or obvious uh, uh, characteristics or variables to look at. Um, speed of a robot is clearly a, a, a salient um, a, a influence on uh, trust. So, um, we know that digital human modeling tools offer limited predictive capability. For a start, they offer limited physical analysis. So they offer some physical analysis of, um, and they show where a physical, you know, where a body will impact on, on components and systems, but it's not wholly accurate. Having done work in this area to date, uh, we found that the physical analysis it offers does not account for some physical motion. So for example, in the aerospace uh, pictures I previously showed, where people have to lean back and, and stretch back um, underneath something and, and with their arms upstretched, it doesn't account for an activity like that. People often bend their legs when working um, because it, it alleviates strain on the legs. So they would sort of swap from one leg to another and, and maybe crouch to reach something. Um, phys uh, the physical analysis in DHM softwares to date uh, don't cover lower body. So that's a big um, limitation. And of course, going back to my focus on psychological data, there's no cognitive um, modeling at all offered by those uh, current tools. 
So uh, to try and improve uh, digital human modeling, uh, specifically for human robot collaboration design, we tested the feasibility of integrating a human cognitive rule. And uh, this was rather exciting because nobody had ever done that sort of work before. So what we did to de 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 uh, identify the speed and trust rule was uh, get participants in the lab um, and have them work with uh, robots at different speeds to gather some benchmark speed trust data. And that helped us to identify an optimal range of speed, if you like, that would bring about the most, um, the, the most uh, effective or ideal trust, levels of trust. Um, the level of trust is uh, determined by, obviously you want to, to get a, a good level of trust in the robot, but not too much trust. So it's not about um, increasing trust to an nth degree, it's about getting that range where somebody's trusting of the robot so that they can perform their tasks efficiently, but not so trusting that they um, are blasé and uh, will do anything. Um, so we could then conducted a task analysis of a, a current wholly manual use case. So this was not flap installation this time, but slat installation uh, of an A320 within Airbus. Um, we looked at the, um, so broke down that task so that we could identify all the individual steps involved in the task of the, that the person has to do. And that would help us to be able to um, essentially allocate functions by modeling, uh, using CAD modeling uh, to create um, a model of the existing process and then redistribute um, the tasks, uh, allocate functions to the robot uh, to create a new um, human robot collaboration process design. Um, how, how basically how we would split it up if we were then to, to, to develop that process into a human robot collaboration system. So we then built a robot, robot demonstrator in the lab, which would re represent that new human robot collaboration design where the functions have been split between the human and the uh, robot. And then we conducted another set of participant studies, this time um, to test the reliability of the rule because the design, the CAD model, the new CAD model had uh, integrated the new rule, the speed trust rule. So it had predicted what speed the robot should run at to, um, to evoke the optimal range of trust. Um, and what we found were, I suppose, the, the, the key findings were that the ideal trust scores uh, is when the robot is running at around 550 millimeters per second. Um, and most importantly, the predictive accuracy of the CAD model with the integrated speed trust rule, rule was very good. And, I, and what this means is if we as human factors uh, practitioners can evaluate and um, human activity, develop rules such as these, and then pass them over to the engineering approaches uh, like CAD modeling, it means that that can improve uh, the human ethics, the human factors, the human factors integration within a system um, and improve not only uh, performance efficiency, but also well-being um, and uh, human-centered design uh, from an ethical point of view. Um, just a, a little extra one, we looked at uh, Intelligent work Workbench and th this uh, example I'm including because what we did here, it was again about retaining the work work workforce entirely but improving throughput rate. But here we in, invoked, uh, sorry, we employed workshops to capture operators' feedback and promote buying because with the, they're one and the same. You, you start employing operator feedback, they aut automatically become more invested in the development of the process um, and are more likely to, to buy into its implementation. And we looked at ergonomic and functional usability analysis. And again, we employed task analysis to identify key task changes that would be required. And we used eye tracking uh, as a way of um, understanding uh, what the operators uh, were looking at and where they would be best be focused in terms of um, instructions and uh, things like that. Um, and a lot of the design and process improvements were taken forward and this, this system is now implemented in a UK uh, assembly facility. Um, and as I said, the importance of this for me is that import, uh, is the uh, introduction of um, worker feedback um, in the design stage, because as I pointed out earlier on, human factors has been um, a part of very late stage design, uh, design activity, uh, often in post operations and remedial interventions, 
um, and this uh, shows uh, the, the advantages of including workforce uh, human-centered design principles at an earlier stage. So going back to the question of, of are we ready uh, to put people with robots together and are we, uh, do we have a handle on industrial robot ethics? Um, you know, we can understand that previously it hasn't been re re relevant because of the physical se separation of industrial robots. Um, they've been kept totally separate. Uh, individuals have been, the workforce has been advised that, um, you know, to keep away from robots. They've been working under that premise. Now we are saying to them, well, you know, that was how it was, but now you can work with this robot X, Y, and Z. Um, and that has, a, you know, that could have a profound effect on their trust and comfort with um, a new robot. Um, but it's significantly more important in collaborative systems to include um, psychological and ethical aspects due to those cognitive and effect effective human interactions that I spoke about. Obviously, it's just a, a general principle that the more you have people engaging with a non-human system, or indeed a human, um, the more cognitive and effective um, in, uh, imp impacts and design implications there are. Also, um, human factors integration is inherently linked to ethics. Um, we're talking about, in, in my work, you know, understanding human activities, uh, trying to improve performance, but it's inherently linked in there that there's an ethical aspect of this. If we're designing for better um, human performance and well-being, we are naturally also um, taking care of some of those um, ethical issues. Uh, obviously, there are more, and it's not as simple as that. But it is a, a you know, it's the reason I'm presenting why human factors work today. Um, human attributes and experiences influence system performance. There's no doubt about it. Um, I showed you my very early PhD data, um, not because it's all about me, but because it's it's really interesting to see in a very um, regulated, very controlled, automated system, how people's experiences over lunch or break or, or coming onto duty uh, and their human attributes in some way can very much influence uh, a regulated uh, system. Um, and also just to say that the standards for industrial robots, because of the um, previous irrelevance of, of perhaps of, of human ethics and such, they cover very little of either human factors or ethics. So um, I work with, uh, for example, um, ISO uh, TC299 Industrial Safety, uh, which is uh, work group three. And, you know, I have little contribution in a way because there's, there's nothing there at the moment that covers any of those issues. It's very much focused on physical design and physical safety, which is perfectly understandable and um, appropriate. However, I do see there is going to be an emergence of some better um, or more inclusive understanding of uh, psychological and effective issues. Um, but pleased to say, as Osman referred to, uh, BS8611, I was a part of the working group on that. We developed the world's first ethics standard uh, for the design and application of, of robotics. Um, it's of limited use, direct use for industry in that it's general and it covers uh, design principles. Um, but I'm fully aware that a design engineer or a system integrator at the present time will not be able to go to that standard and there's no lookup table, there's no um, specifics of, of what they need to do um, in their work to improve uh, human factors and ethics. So um, that's a, a, a not a, a negative, it's BS8611 is a really groundbreaking uh, good start. So just to emphasize BS8611, um, the bit that I'm particularly proud of or, or see as most relevant is this section here um, in the scope. Most physical hazards can result in fear and stress, which are psychological hazards. So there's not to say that there are not separate psychological ha hazards and, and ethical issues, but that the engineering approach to only looking at physical hazards actually does already have a direct relationship with the psychological hazards. Um, the link between phys physical and psychological harm is indeed ethical design. Um, and also just a, a new development, I've been part of um, ISO uh, 
TC159, um, SC4, WG6, which is the ergonomics of human systems interaction. Um, and we've developed a, a technical report, um, part 810, on robotic, intelligent, and automated systems. Um, and as it spells out here, it's not an exploration of the physical, uh, sorry, the philosophical, ethical, or political issues surrounding robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera. Um, and it refers to BS8611 and IECP 7000 for those. However, it does identify where and why ethical issues need to be taken in, into account for a wide range of systems. Now, similar to BS8611, it doesn't provide practical guidance that the systems integrator or the system designer can pick up and, and directly apply, but it does provide a groundbreaking start to thinking about where human-centered design and ethical issues need to be considered. Um, again, so another source of um, fundamental knowledge and uh, pride for me. Um, going back to, I'm repeating this slide, the job characteristics model, whether or not it's used uh, in everyday practitioners uh, toolbox or toolkit, I think it's really important to, to um, underline those important job characteristics. Um, and if we want to think about ethical design of uh, industrial robots, we really should think about these issues, um, these, these human issues that even from an old model from 1980 are still very, very relevant. Um, how much do the skills that we assign to the human uh, provide variety and therefore meaningfulness of the work? Um, how much do they enable the person to identify with the task um, so that they understand what, where it's leading to and how, what it means for them. Um, so for example, when you contribute to the production of a, an aircraft, you have a sense of pride perhaps in, in, in the aircraft, seeing aircraft fly um, and what you've produced um, and uh, the task significance as well. You know, for example, contributing to something that, that's uh, medical may give you uh, significance in terms of you understand the output in terms of, of human life and that gives you meaningless, meaningfulness. I'm only giving you some quick examples there, but just to show that the meaningfulness of the work is quite important to motivation, that intrinsic motivation that I described. Obviously, autonomy and feedback, you know, we're, we're always in danger of, of reducing autonomy in um, in any automated system. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And I've been involved in some European projects that are uh, dealing with feedback of um, robotic systems, which is great because without feedback, um, not only is the person less aware of the robotics, uh, robot state and requirements, but they're also uh, not, you know, they, they need feedback on their own personal contributions as well. Okay, so are we ready? Um, answering the initial question. Uh, there's no doubt that industry and manufacturing is being transformed by robotics and that we still need human skill. That's a real um, point to emphasize. We won't, we won't do away with human skill by robotics for a long time, as far as I can see, if ever. Um, are we equipped to design and implement new human-centered process, processes and technologies effectively and ethically? I believe we are, but I believe we need to integrate human factors like never before. And interestingly, I, I listen to the radio while I'm driving. Um, and I recently, I don't know who it was, it was a roboticist um, had actually was dealing with this point in a, in a conversation and said, the role of the ergonomist has never been so important, um, which I found quite amusing and thought I'd just drop in there that, that the role of the human factors practitioners, the psychologists, the ergonomists who are all involved in the development of human analysis for the human robot interaction uh, in the industrial setting, um, it's never been so important. So um, that means we're important, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, we are uh, a bit behind the schedule, but uh, I, I give the assembly permission to ask a question. And then if you have, and you certainly have, more questions, uh, please uh, use uh, the uh, uh, question and answer or the chat or whatever. Okay, go. No questions? I have a, I have a question. I have many questions. <laughs> 
Yes, because I'm still trying to find out how to stop sharing. <laughs> Because you have given us all uh, this uh, beautifully organized uh, perspective from the way we have been interacting with the uh, machines uh, since the, the first industrial revolution until now, and uh, how everything our um, labor has been uh, organized and uh, how machines have impacted our uh, societies, our way of working, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the fundamental role of human factors it is and i indeed agree that human factors and ethics are intrinsic uh, linked so i just ask a, a general question uh, it is how do you think what kind of uh, uh, at at any level uh, what do you think has to be done so that a human centered perspective starts to be implemented in design from the start and is not just something uh, remedial or or something like that uh, what has to be uh, is it related to education is it related to training at organization level uh, just tell me sarah Okay, well, I, in a way, I think it's already being addressed. I think um, George, Dr. George Michalas and uh, Iveta, Dr. Iveta Amantate will present some work later on that I know of, um, and Anouk, Dr. Anouk uh, Van Maris, they're all working on projects that um, are doing such. And I think the, um, I suppose what I was describing in that, in that little history as well of, of my work um, was the development of interest in, in uh, the cognitive aspects, the human factors aspects. Um, I've, I've often joked to uh, my team that, you know, when I started in this area over 20 years ago, if I mentioned the word psychology, in fact, it was a block. If you mentioned that near the shop floor, you would be in trouble because it was uh, as if you were um, bringing in something that was, was very wrong to uh, industrial design. Um, and in fact, we had to, avoid using words like psychology and, and, uh, and human factors. Um, we used to call it call ourselves ergonomists simply because that was understood and a little bit more palatable. I think we've already got a, a sea change and I think the work that um, is done I, that I know of in Europe particularly um, is very much pushing forward the integration of human factors at an early stage. I still think there's a long way to go but um, Certainly even 10 years ago, I'd say that the human factors integration was very little. Human factors was employed almost like a tick box exercise to, um, to say that you had looked at the human aspects. Whereas I think the, the current work we're involved in, um, again, I'm referred to Dr. George and um, Dr. Avetta, um, it's more integrated all the way through the design of the robot systems. So um, I'm not sure how, how to promote it even more other than what we're doing, um, but I think it is changing. Okay, thank you so much.